Hello, Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. So we're now back, we've gotten past 300, so we're now hitting the 301, we're going another 100, well, two, three, four, maybe we can get to 1,000, who knows? I'll probably retire at that point, because that'd be like 700 more episodes, and um, I'm lucky if I do 50 a year, so that's like another 15 years probably, so man, if I get to 1,000, Anyway, so um, let's, uh, Let's get right into some South African wine. Now, I have next episode is going to be an episode of South African wine that was sent to me um, by somebody that I conversed with on Twitter. And um, he said, hey, you know, before you have my wines, which should be really kick ass. OK, so we're about to see if they're kick ass or not. Um, you should, you know, have some other South African wines. And it's been a while since I've had a South African wine. Actually, I've had one in the past couple months, and it was all right. But most South, most South African wines haven't floored me. And that's really why you don't see me doing a lot of them. Um, but as I move into my more advanced studies, I'm going to need to know a little bit more about South African wine. There might be a South African wine in the blind. I doubt it. But if it's going to be one, it's probably going to be one of... Um, Two grapes is probably going to be Steen or Pinotage. Neither one, well, we have a Steen, and they actually didn't label it Steen. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, the others are not Pinotage, which, um, you know, what I hear is Pinotage isn't really that great. I've had a couple Pinotages. Again, nothing to write home about, but maybe I just had the wrong ones. So we're going to do some South African wines here. Uh, these two I did buy. I bought them um, at Specs, and honestly, I didn't know what to buy. I just went with whatever their shelf talker said. With the, they had two, they had a white and a red they recommended. So um, I went with that. So we'll see how it is. So let's hop right into oh, it. Just before I hop into it, again, thank you to everybody who was at Max's Wine Dive for episode 300. Um, again, another apology for the crappy audio uh, for the live stream. I was gonna, I thought about live streaming this, but. I'm on a crunch. I'm a little time crunch. I have a Spurs game that starts in an hour and a half, and I still have to grab food um, and get two wine shows done. So let's get this going. Uh, but anyway, um, hopefully I'll have some more live streams later. Okay, so let's uh, let's dive into this. So this is the Nguni, and I'm I'm just assuming I'm pronouncing this one right. It seems pretty seems pretty obvious how it's pronounced, but. Um, I also know that uh, Vietnamese name that starts with uh, N G U Y N is called is pronounced Win, not Nguyen or something like that. So, anyway, Nguyen. This is the 2012 Chenin Blanc, aka Steen, in the South African world. I don't know why they didn't put Steen on here. Maybe they're trying to market to the rest of the world because to, as what the the grape is. But anyway, uh, 2012 Chenin Blanc. It says a South African icon. It has to do with the uh, the steer here, um, the animal. But uh, 1799 at specs, so not an inexpensive wine. Um, this comes from the Three Foxes CC is the winery that's listed on the back. Um, and uh, Pascal Schilt, Pascal Schilt is the importer in France. Uh, the USA importer is USA Wine West LLC out of Sausalito, California. I couldn't find anything about them. Like, there's no website, really. Um, but uh, three, the threefoxes.com, and I'll have the link at the website uh, for that, but it's a dash in between the, each word, um, has info the label and the three foxes. There's not much else. Pascal Sch uh, Schilt is a partner in Three Foxes. Um, so that's about all I know. There's three guys. 
Um, and I basically, I th well, the Schultz guy, I'm going to write up on him. He is somebody that, you know, had a passion for wine, um, lived in France for a while, I uh, believe is from South Africa, actually from the Western Cape, which is where this is from, uh, the wine is from, and uh, kind of got into the winemaking business and all that, along with these other two guys. Um, so anyway, but as far as anything else about the winery, there isn't a whole heck of a lot. Uh, the Nguni is an indigenous cattle of South Africa introduced by the Bant Bantu tribes from the north of the continent. Uh, it is used to pay what's called lobolo, or, or commonly known as the bride price. Um, custom of exchanging cattle when asking, uh, when asking a hand in marriage is a sign of respect and wealth in the African culture. So, you know, basically a dowry, right? Not uncommon in uh, the ancient world. So, um, and I'm sure there's still dowries out there in some cultures. So, Chenin Blanc is also known as Steen in South Africa. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, so white wine, obviously. A little hydration there. It's kind of hot today. It says 88 on the inter intranets. So on the nose, uh, just, you know, the normal citrusy type of stuff. Maybe even a little bit of uh, uh, melon rind. Almost kind of like peach skin. You know, the lemon and lime isn't as pronounced, um, but, you know, we have a definitely a citrus type of, or stone fruit type of aroma to it. And just kind of a, see, I, I get this on white wines a lot and I struggle with how I want to describe it. And it, it happens all the time. And rind is usually the closest I can come up with, but it's not really like the cantaloupe rind or melon rind, uh, the outside of it. It's somewhat of a artificial or not plastic smell, but something processed. But we'll go with rind. It's probably really the best descriptor for it. I don't want to say there's honey, but there is another aroma that's coming through that I'm not able to describe. So structure, medium acid, medium, well, medium plus high acid, really. Um, the palate and, and the nose are fairly, fairly close. Um, there's kind of almost like a, a powdered feeling to it. Um, almost like a powdered feeling to it. Um, Spill a little of the wine on the table. Setting up. That sucked. Um, again, somewhat citrusy, somewhat. Um, I don't really get much stone fruit or melon on the palate. Um, I honestly would think this is a, a funky Sauvignon Blanc of some sort, or it might be a Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio or generic Chardonnay. Um, it's just I don't have a lot of experience really drinking Chenin Blanc, identifying what makes it Chenin Blanc versus a lot of other high acid, uh, dry white wines that don't have a lot of oak treatment to it. So stainless steel type of stuff. So um, definitely don't know oak on this. Um, probably stainless steel or maybe concrete vats. Been reading that uh, California has been starting to get into the concrete business um, now that they're starting to make them over in the United States instead of having to ship them from France. Saw a bunch of that in France. It was kind of cool. It's definitely refreshing. Um, 
There's a tartness to it, high acid. I'm, this medium plus, no, that's out the window. It's high acid. Um, it's refreshing. It's nice. I like it. Um, $18 worth. Uh, it's South African. It's Chenin Blanc. I, I can't go more than that because it's like, you know what, if, if, I had, if I had to put this up against another Chenin Blanc or just another white wine in the same price range, it kind of tastes similar to a lot of other wines, but there is something slightly different about it. So that, that's what's got going for it. Um, again, I don't drink a lot of Chenin Blancs. The some that I have had in the distant past were really crappy ones. I mean, we're talking like, you know, the Sutter Home or the whatever, like $5, $5 swill, you know, because I was on the cheap and I wanted some wine and it was five bucks or $4 or $3.99 or something like that. So this definitely tastes better than that because um, God knows if that was really Chenin Blanc. I say not bad, you know, if you want to try something from South Africa, this is Chenin Blanc, you know, and you got 18 bucks to spend, check it out. All right, so let's get on to wine number two. All right, so let's go to wine number two. Um, this is the uh, Tierheck Grenache Syrah 2010. Also bought it Specs for $23.99. Um, so I got that going on here. So no Pinotage. Okay. No Pinotage. All right, so what's about this? So this was established in 1886 as a family operation, as a farm. I'm sorry. I, said, I thought I said fam there. As a farm. Uh, it was one of the oldest surviving and original uh, Sandveld farms um, on the west coast. It was owned by the Marais family from 1886 until 2001. So they had it for a very long time. Uh, it's currently owned by Tony and Shelley Sandell and um, the Sandveld southwest corner of, it's on the south, see, Sandveld southwest corner of the Western Cape, specifically in the Peak, oh man, I really should have looked at this ahead of time. Pekin, Pekin Sir Kloof Mountain Area. <whistles> Pekin Sir Skloof. Skloof. Pekin Sir Skloof Mountain Area. Man. Yeah, go to the website. I got, I'll have a link to, um, to their website. According to the website, uh, Tierheck ideally suited for vineyards. That's just a vineyard, Tierheck. Tierheck. Um, oh, it has a unique climate, soils, and aspect give intense fruit flavors, subtle minerality, and fresh, fresh acidity. So typical, you know, marketing would love to tell you how great their wine is. Some wines are great. Some are average. But the, the back label makes you think it's the best wine in the world. So uh, 24 bucks. So let's check it out. A Grenache Syrah blend, 60% Grenache, 40% Syrah. So I'm interested in doing this. Basically kind of a Rhone style. Kind of interesting on the nose. Not, it, not, and, and I know at times when people say interesting means it's, sh I'm sorry, bad. No. This is interesting. It's like kind of cool. So, somewhat meaty, but I'm getting kind of that cooked, and I don't mean the wine's cooked, but kind of a stewed fruit. Kind of really plummy. Dates, dates, kind of, yeah. Kind of date like. In a way, it is kind of stewed fruit, almost, almost oxidized, almost cooked, but not quite. Yeah, really, just kind of dried fruit. Yeah, more dried fruit, dried fruit type of stuff, not quite cooked. That's a bad. That's a bad description of it. So a bit prickly, um, 
kind of woodsy. The initial attack was kind of woodsy, but real, I'm sorry, the initial attack was kind of fruit forward-ish. -ish. Um, again, I wouldn't say dried fruit or stewed fruit, but you know, more of a fruit flavor. And then the wood kind of, the wood flavor kind of took over. I wouldn't call it earthy or savory or meaty, um, things that you would expect from say the Syrah side of things. It is, I'd say a medium bodied wine. Um, Grenache typically creates <clears throat> maybe a, somewhat of a lighter style, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's interesting. Again, not in a bad way. It's really just kind of like that, again, we're talking plummy, date kind of, not quite raisiny um, uh, fruit, but I would say probably kind of dried red fruit, um, not a lot of earthiness to it. Um, the wood doesn't really seem to come, get, come through right now. So again, it could have been just like that first initial attack on the palate, and now I've had, had a little bit more. It's not as, it doesn't attack the palate. But acid, I would say it's probably medium plus. I mean, my mouth is really watering. Um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, let's see what it says here. <laughs> spice. They say, you know what? Yeah, maybe it has a little bit of spice to it. I think that's where I'm getting that dried fruit. Um, cause there was something else I was missing out of it. Mm-hmm. Now I'm thinking spices. So I wouldn't say necessarily nutmeg, but kind of a potpourri, kind of potpourri uh, aroma too, or really more of the flavor. Um, when, I, when I have it in my mouth and I'm breathing out through my nose, that's where I get the wood. I get more of the wood stuff. But yeah, maybe kind of cedary. Because now, now it's starting to develop in my mouth. I'm starting to really kind of just stream of conscious instead of like just focusing on one thing. Um, and the spice really kind of triggered something. So kind of, I wouldn't say cigar box, but, you know, spice box. So lots of maybe subtle, not, not overpowering, but subtle on that. It's not bad. I mean, it's $24. So again, not an inexpensive bottle of wine, but nothing, ex but not uh, outrageously expensive. South African, it's, it's not like any other Rhone type of blend I've ever had. It doesn't taste like uh, Australian. Um, it doesn't taste California. I mean, it's different. It's kind of neat. It's, it's a different style. It's something to kind of get your, wrap your head around. It's almost kind of like an Italian raisined wine meets somewhat New World style. That's because that, that raisinated... Um, fruit would probably make me think Italian first, but but it wouldn't. Like there's stuff about the wine, I'd go, man, I can't take it to Italy because it's not an Amarone or Valpolicella. So, <clears throat> I like it. It's pretty good. It's actually really good. If you if you find it in the uh, find it in your aisle, probably your wine shop at your grocery store. Uh, check it out. All right, so let's do a little bit of learning on South African wine. Oh, my goodness. A Wine 101 in what? Hasn't been like eight months. So, hey, I know a wine, wine 101. Got the green screen back. Not back. I've always had it, but I was just getting lazy. So, yeah, uh, let's check it out. Okay. Hey, I actually remember to move my butt over so all this over here can be used. So, let's uh, let's talk about... South African wine, a little wine 101 action here. All right, so um, South Africa has been making wine for a very long time. They first planted their vineyards in 1659, uh, or that was the first harvest. Uh, There's a Dutch, servant named, Dutch surgeon named Jan van Riebeck of the Dutch East India Company. So <clears throat> when, when, when people migrated throughout the world, one of the things they brought with them is 
grapes to make wine because they loved wine or they or they uh, would bring grains or they would look for the grain look for grains in other parts of the world to make beer so alcohol was a very big deal you know back in the day um, and you have to remember that alcohol in some ways was an alternative to water because if you had a if you had a poor uh, water source uh, beer was used to um, purify water and grape juice was just you know was water not water but you know that was a substitute for water anyway um, he was tasked to manage the station there and plant vineyards um, so we talked about this wine was used to ward off scurvy during the spice route so uh, the Dutch East India Company they would go all the way around the Cape of Good Hope you know South Africa to get to India for the spice route there was no Suez Canal back in the day um, in 1685, a gentleman by the name of Simon van der Stel bought 750 hectares um, in the area. The vineyard was located just out of Cape Town. It's called uh, Constantia. Um, it's a very well-known, very famous vineyard uh, in South African uh, wine history. Um, after he died, the vineyard kind of just wasn't being maintained, so it kind of fell into disrepair. Uh, and it was revived in 1778 by a gentleman by, a gentleman by the name of Hendrik Cleet. I'm, I'm guessing on some of these pronunciations. I mean, South African or Afrikaans is basically Dutch, which is basically German. So, I mean, not somewhat. All re, they're all related. Let's put it that way. So, um, not much of an industry during this time. Uh, many growers switched for, to alfalfa and orchards to make money. Uh, some planted very high-yielding varieties, such as Cinso, so they can make money. Uh, in the early 1900s, the, the area developed what was known as a wine lake. So there's, there's various wine lakes in the old world. Um, in, in, I guess California, the Central Valley is kind of a wine lake. I mean, it's hugely fertile and they can grow anything there. So they grow a lot of bulk grapes there or wa grapes for bulk wines. Uh, south of France, um, known as Wine Lake and uh, the kind of the heel of Italy, another wine lake. Um, grows lots of grapes to make wine. So South Africa, same idea, wine lake. So we're talking not high quality wines, but wines that are, you know, for the bulk industry. Uh, depressed prices uh, is the reason that the South African government created this thing called the KWV. Now we're going to have fun with this one, okay? So it's the uh, cooperative, uh, cooperative, I guess, wine bowers, vernid Verniging, yeah. So it translates into the Cooperative Winemaker Society of South Africa. Uh, oh yeah, Van Zuid Africa, BPKT. I don't know what the BPKT stands for. Probably one of those like you know GMB something a German. So probably like a like Inc in the United States. Uh, so basically, it was a cooperative of wine growers, and over the years. Um, it became very powerful, and it eventually became the KWV uh, brand of wine and spirits. So let's talk about them for a little bit. Um, they they set policies and prices that through the South African government. Um, they they were trying to increase uh, quality of the wine, so they would restrict yields, set minimum prices to kind of deal with this wine glut. Um, they also encouraged, from, this, from the, having all this extra wine around, encouraged the production of fortified wines and, and brandies. So, because uh, remember, brandies, cognacs, all that comes from grape juice, okay? It's just distilled instead of, uh, it's distilled wine or distilled grape juice instead of just fermented. Um, and now they are a global brand. So, getting into the 20th century, so much of the 20th century is kind of ignored in the South African wine industry, especially with apartheid. Um, it prevented the export of wine, especially in the latter part of the 20th century until they ended that. Um, KWV, KWV eventually became privatized, and what that did is allowed them to do some innovation, improve their quality much more. Uh, they eventually shifted from majority of production of distillation, so brandies and fortified wines, to uh, vinification, as in regular wines. All right, so let's talk about the climate of South Africa. Um, it's considered a Mediterranean climate. It's mostly, um, so you have cold, wet winters and hot, dry summers. Uh, area uh, within that, er within the main area of South Africa, rainfall will vary greatly. So, I mean, it's not like just one little small part of a country. It's a, you know, large area. 
Uh, they can go anywhere from under 10 inches a year to almost 60 inches a year. So wide range of rainfall. Uh, you probably don't want to be growing too many grapes in the 60 inches per year part of the country. Um, where they do need it, they'll use irrigation. Uh, Benguela, uh, the Benguela current from Antarctica keeps the area cooler than other regi regions of comparable latitude. So, um, you know, while it is, you know, Africa, it's South Africa, it's near the Antarctic, it's not like it's the Sahara. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's dry regions of South Africa, but, you know, this isn't, you know, the Sahara Desert or, you know, Saudi Arabia where it's just rolling deserts. I mean, it's a lush green country. Um, and there's something called the Cape Doctor. It's a wind, uh, and it limits the fungal disease in mildew. So it can get very humid or moist in the area where, where it's not like dry as far as like the 10 inches a year. So moisture hurts grapes um, if, it's, if it's there too long, if it starts cooling down, you don't want mildew and, and all the crap on the wine, on the grapes. So if you have a nice steady wind, it helps keep the grapes dry. All right. So um, the, as far as geography with South Africa, you have regions in the Western and Northern Cape. Um, it's, it stretches from west to east, 310 miles, and from north to south, 420 miles. Um, soils, kind of the same, same players as anywhere else in the world. Uh, you have the usual players, clay, granite, sandstone, shale, lime, calcium, and all, all the normal, all the normal uh, soils. So there's nothing like, you know, specific or unique to South African soil. We're not talking like red soils like in Australia. Barossa, I believe, right? Um, so wine law. So in 1973, they decided to create um, their own appellation system called Wine of Origin, or WO, uh, based upon the French system. Um, it's more concerned with the accuracy of labeling, so somewhat more like the United States labeling laws. Uh, there's no regulations on what you have to grow, uh, the aging, things like that. How many, how much, where your yields can be. Um, it's the in in the way the WO is divided. You'll have a geographical unit, which is kind of like um, Australia because they're called GIs, geographical indications. Um, then you have a region, a district, and a ward. All right. So the WOs, um, you have the Western Capes. Well, I'm sorry, Western Cape. And that's all Appalachians except for the Northern Cape. So that's why you hit Western Cape and Northern Cape. Then you have um, the KwaZulu Natal. It was formed in 2005 in August. You have the Eastern Cape, formed in 2009. The Limpopo, and then, and then of course, Northern Cape. So you have one, two, three, four, five WOs. I'm sorry, GUs. Okay. Uh, then you have a bunch of regions and districts, and we're not going to go through every single one of these things. We're just going to—I'm just highlighting some of the better known or the the main regions. So in the Western Cape, you've got the Boberg, and that will have fortified wines from the Parle, uh, Frank Schle Frank Scheck, and Toolba. Um, the Breed River Valley, so Breedelkloof, uh, Robertson, and Worcester. Uh, the Cap Cape South Coast has Cape Agujas. Plettenberg Bay, Sweldendam, and Walker Bay. Uh, the coastal region will have the Cape Point, Darling, Parle again, uh, Franschek, uh, Franschek Valley, Stellenbosch, that's another one that you probably recognize, uh, Swartland, another one that I very uh, recognizable, Tulba and Tigerberg. The Klein Karoo has the Kalitschdorp, uh, Langeberg Garcia. Oh, Garcia, huh? Yeah, so somebody from Spain probably is in the area. Uh, the Oliphants River. So remember uh, the, the Oliphants in um, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So uh, he was uh, in, he was influenced by the uh, a lot of Dutch and German or, or Germanic type of uh, mythologies. That's where all the dwarves and the elves come from. Anyway, uh, so the Citrusdal Mountain, Citrusdal Valley, Lutzville Valley. The Northern Cape has the Douglas, Sutherland, and Karoo, and Eastern Cape has no districts. It's just the Eastern Cape. There's a quiz at the end of the show. No, there's not. So there's some of these some of these districts are somewhat more familiar than others to me and probably some other people. Some of these, a lot of these are kind of like I've never heard of them until I did the research. Um, wards. We're not going to go through all the wards, but we're just going to kind of talk about how many there are. And the Western Cape has 57 wards. The Northern Cape has three wards, and 
Of course, the Eastern Cape has no wards because it has no districts. So you can't have a ward if you don't have a district. Uh, so we're talking about some notable areas. So Constantia, Constantia, I'm sorry, or maybe it's Constantia, uh, was the first area in South Africa. It's south of Cape Town. Uh, then you have Stellenbosch. It's the second oldest region. It does about 14% of the total wine production. Uh, it was first planted in 1679. Uh, and instead of it's so as far as where it's related to Cape Town, it's east of Cape Town. And uh, that's where the Stellenbosch University is. Um, it's kind of South Africa's version of UC Davis. Uh, they have people there go for their enology uh, degrees and viticulture and viticulture and all that good stuff and learn how to make wine. Parle. Now, this is, this is basically the heart of the South African wine industry for most of the 20th century. Uh, it's also the home of the KWV and then the Niederberg Wine Auction. So this is, you know, basically where they kind of set their prices and they uh, figure out the reputation of the vintage or the estate. It influences that. It uh, has a history of fortified wines, uh, again, with the KWV. Um, and there's some other notable areas, but not as well known, because we're trying to not take too long on this Wine 101. Uh, various grapes from France, Italy, Spain, etc. Those are, these are the grapes that they've used. The top eight by acreage. Now, this was from about two or three years ago. Uh, Chenin Blanc, also known as Steen, that was 18%. Now, I did a little bit of extra research about, about the word Steen. Um, so it was something um, of one of those kind of things that it just kind of was, a, I guess, a bastardization of, of a word or a phrase. So when they brought some grapes back in the day, when uh, Jan brought some grapes or brought the vines, uh, they brought... They brought grapes called, da, 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 da. Oh, I just had them up here real quick. Uh, Grendruf, which is Semion, uh, Franzdruf, and Steen. Uh, now, the origin of the names Franzdruf and Steen are intertwined. There's a theory that the name Steen developed when the Dutch who settled in the Cape decoded Listan to Lastan, then to De Steen, and finally Steen. Sure. About the only place I could find anything about it. I mean, I was a quick search. I wasn't like spending hours trying to find it. Um, and then in the 1920s, it was established that Franz Drift rather than Steen was the variety Listan in France and Palomino in Spain. Okay, so we got our little learning on there. Oh, heck to the no. I just turned on the, just put the computer to sleep. Anyway, so um, as I'm trying to type my password and talk at the same time, um, let's get back to this. So anyway, so Steen, Chenin Blanc. Now, also, I made a comment in one of the, in, in the Chenin Blanc segment, you know, that, uh, I don't know why they use Chenin Blanc instead of Steen. Well, you know what, I, I, I've, kind, I've also been kind of caught up in the whole mythology, I guess, of Steen in the 60s when they figured out that this was actually Chenin Blanc because they didn't know what it was. Um, they decided to, to use the word Chenin Blanc to, to call it its proper name instead of sticking with the South African name. However, you know, for marketing purposes, though, some, some wineries will call it Steen because people know about this. Oh, well, you, did you know Chenin Blanc is Steen in South Africa? You know, kind of make yourself sound all smart and things. Um, so anyway, they, they, uh, they try to use Shannon Blanc as much as possible, but sometimes it will revert to the name Steen. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is 12% of the grape acreage. Uh, Colombard, another French grape. Um, Syrah, however, um, it, I'm going to guess based upon the research I did that some South African wineries will use the Austrian, I'm sorry, the Australian name Shiraz. However, we know that the, the other wine we had earlier was a Grenache Syrah blend, and they use Syrah as the, as the name. Uh, Sauvignon, oh, so that's like 9, 9.8%. Sauvignon Blanc is 9%. Chardonnay, 8%. Pinotage, uh, we'll, go th we'll cover that in a second, 6.5%. Merlot, Merlot, 6%. So that's about 80% of the grapes are right there. The rest of the 20% are just a variety of other grapes. All right, uh, Chenin Blanc uh, is the most planted, and there's a wide range of quality from it. Um, we saw with the with the wine we had earlier today uh, that it's pretty decent, the the one that I had. Um, but I've also just in my experience with South African wines had some 
wines that were labeled, labeled as Steen or labeled as Chenin Blanc that really weren't uh, earth shattering. Pinotage, now this is, the, this is the signature grape of South Africa and I've had some people make some disparaging comments about Pinotage either to me or I've overheard them at conferences and stuff. But this is, you know, a grape that they created. It's a cross of Pinot Noir and Cinceau, so two uh, French grapes. Um, there's many styles and levels of quality. And again, it's kind of disparaged a lot because there can be some flaws to this particular grape in winemaking. Uh, it is known to have a vegetal uh, quality to it that's, that's more of a flaw rather than a, a characteristic. Uh, having the aroma of banana, which that's typically also a flaw in wine, though um, if I remember correctly, banana is also a component of Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, and nail polish, so that's kind of like a volatile acidity or a set, um, um, oh, what's the stupid name, the alcohol? Um, not acetylene, but something like that. Anyway, nail polish. Uh, yeah, that, if you have nail polish aroma or flavor in your wine, it's a bad wine. It's, it's a flawed wine or something wrong with the winemaking process. There's something wrong with it. Nail polish, unlike, you know, when we're talking about other, other when we're talking about Brettanomyces and all the types of stuff it can do, which I, I saw this really interesting uh, Brett wheel, basically, of what that yeast or the ver varieties of yeast of that are in the Brettanomyces family or genus or whatever. Um, all these things and nail polish is actually one of the one of the aromas that you can get from it. But you know, barnyard is another one, band-aid is another one. So you get barnyard, some people are like, oh, it's nice quality to the wine. And other people are going, I don't want manure in my wine. You know, so but nail polish is pretty universally like no bueno. Um, that's it. That's it. We talked about some wines, talked about the history of South Africa, drank some South African wines. Um, hope everyone learned a few things about South Africa. I mean, I didn't cover too much else about grapes because really the two star grapes are Chenin Blanc and you know the Steen theme because that was you know kind of the myth or whatever. And then Pinotage, which unfortunately uh, the next set of wines I don't have Pinotage. But then again, like I said, Pinotage isn't always considered the best example of what they can do in South Africa with wines. Uh, as always, thank you for stopping by. I hope you learned. Uh, I hope you learned a lot here with uh, the little educational thing. And uh, check out those wines I had. Uh, and uh, we're going to see everybody again next week for the second uh, second part of some South African wine. Oh, yeah. Friend me up. Hit the link over here. Um, I have a little ad also for Black Backblaze. I, that's what I use for my backups. Um, they've been really good. So. Uh, and there's also there's an offer code basically too. So if you click the link there, there's it takes you to my offer page. And I think you get like five bucks off or something like that. So um, anyway, check it out. We'll see everyone again next time.